All right, so this is the part I'm going to be doing today. It's a fourth axis part. I have a lot of indexing that's going to be done on here. Um, and depending on how you want to do it, you can set up individual indexes for most of the surfaces. Uh, pretty much any of these surfaces that have kind of a different axis as opposed to the round here. So we got 60 degrees here because there's a hex on the front. Got a couple 45 degree angles there. Just got a pocket that's on both sides, so nothing too crazy. And then on this end down here, I want to use the four axis rotary. So it's going to be a little combination of doing some of the indexing, uh, some pocketing, some uh, probably some open pocketing, how we do, we'll debate how we want to do this one. And then this down here will be done with that fourth axis rotary. And we should be able to limit it and uh, make it cut just that area pretty nice. So before I fully get started, what I like to do is figure out some location that we can reference zero from. And it's a location that I have measurements for. Uh, or at least a, a location that we, something we could we could just make sure everything's turning the right way. I got uh, Randy's in here right now. We're dealing with his with his big mill turn machine right now, just trying to make sure that the that the rotation's the correct direction. And by having a, a specific point that we can call zero is going to be very helpful to us. So right now I could do the pockets as zero, and I can see the pockets line up with zero. I'm going to do it with this hex right here. So if I look right now, I got the corner, one of the corners of those of that hex showing right here. So I want, to, I want to just take this whole part. Let me just fit it to the screen. There we go. And I just want to rotate it so that I got one of these flats that lines up perfectly perpendicular to this Z axis. Now, like I said, this is not something you have to do. We already have kind of a zero with this pocket, but just to go through it, I'm just going to go down here and say rotate. Now, I've already played around with this part of it, but if you need to figure out your rotation, you know, you got six sides here. So that's 360 divided by six. That's how you'll figure out the angle in between. And since I'm centered on one of those kind of angles, I just need half of that. So if you want, you can just say divided by two, or you can just type in 30. Now for the rotate in version 31, we just click on the geometry. Well, let me clear this out. I want to rotate everything that I have drawn. So I'm just going to turn on my other layer, pick everything. And then now we can see it's a small rotation, but what we're looking at is this preview right here showing us a nice flat. So that's what we're paying attention to. And uh, I don't want to make sure there's any copies on. So you want to make sure to turn that off. If you did turn it on, I was playing with it earlier. So then I'll hit OK and then cancel out. So now we have this kind of set up for our origin. And that's kind of lined up with our zero. So we have a reference point that we can use. So now I can go to my cam tree, right click on cam defaults and say new job. And from here, I'm going to choose milling, but we got to make sure to pick the correct machine. So for most of you guys, uh, you will probably want to get some work done to the four axis machines. Now, if it's just a standard you know, three axis machine with a rotary, there's a chance you can use the BC4X mill as your machine. Um, but the post processor is still going to have to get work done to it to make sure it works, because this one usually doesn't work on just any machine. Um, so it's going to have just a generic little post in it by default. And you'll just want to make sure to get a post for your fourth axis. And so from here, we're going to go right down to the stock wizard. And then I'm going to skip the workpiece, just hit next. I don't really care. I only have one solid, so the workpiece isn't too relevant. And then right here, I'm just going to choose cylindrical stock. But down here, we got to make sure to change from the Z axis to the X axis so that it extrudes the correct way. And then you'll see it creates just this little piece of geometry. So now what I could do is I could come up here and say calculate my stock, and it'll find it based on my model because I'm grabbing my geometry from the graphics area. So the part's uh, eight inches long. I'm gonna go ahead and say on the end face, let's add uh, two inches of material. That should be enough, uh, not on the end face, the other face. I wanna go, I guess, on the start face is the way they got this going. So two inches there, and that'll extend it. Um, and I'm not gonna turn anything. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm saying we're starting out with this just straight two inch bar uh, stock. So no extra material there. And then the directions and everything, it's all pretty well set up. We just want to create a cylinder down that part. And then from here, we could go ahead and hit this next button or forward. And then this is where we could set up the origin. Now, you can set the origin really wherever you want. But the best way to set up the origin is have the x-axis go right down the center of your geometry. So that's how I have it set up by default now, especially since that's how I drew my part. It is centered on x, y, z, zero. If you were to go in and start changing things like picking the origin here, that's where you'll start using things like the work offset to then put a shift in to shift kind of the, the point where you'd need 
the center of rotation. So when you're working four and five axis and you start talking about center of rotations and all this stuff, if you pick a point like up here, we then need to calculate what distance we moved to get back to the center of rotation. So I've just found it easier. If I'm going to zero out off the top of the part for X and Y, I could zero there and then jog over and move down and then set up my Z. And that lets me leave it right here in the middle. And then it's just one less thing to have to worry about. You really don't have to mess with it too much. So after we have that, we can go ahead and just hit OK. My clearance plane set to one inch and then we hit OK. So from here, anything that currently sits along the zero degree position could be cut. We don't need an index for it. I still like to set up indexes for everything, especially so even something like this. Yes, that's flat, but I'd like to have an, uh, an index for it. So I'm going to start off by creating some indexes. And uh, they're pretty easy to make. You have two real ways of making them. So I'm going to right click here and just go down to additional functions. And then I'm going to say add index. So add index, you get two choices. You can pick a surface or you can pick a UCS. We're going to do an example of both. So pick a surface is really easy. You go in, you click on the surface, you'll see the arrow point from that surface. That arrow should always point straight up perpendicular from the surface that you select. And then after we have it, we go ahead and just hit OK. And so now under the machine setup, we'll have an index system right there. That one index system is for this top of part right here. Now, the other way of creating an index system would be actually going over here to like our UCS and then taking something like a top plane UCS and I can right click and then say add new UCS. And then I want to just say rotate my UCS. So I have a UCS right there in the middle. So I know from where I'm sitting now, if I rotate this 60 degrees around my X axis, so I'll just say 60 degrees, it's going to line up with this one. Now, it doesn't change where the origin is. So the origin's still at zero, but now it knows the direction to come in from. And that's kind of one of the big things we're telling it is what direction it needs to come from. So I can do this. I can name it. So I'll call it... Uh, 60 degree, oh, caps lock got turned off, 60 degree, and then I can hit OK, and then cancel out. So from there, now I have this 60 degree one. I can go back to my top plane and jump back over to my uh, stock over here and blank that out, back into the cam tree. So now when I go and do this index, I can go down to additional functions, add index, and now say, I want to go ahead and just pick a UCS. Now, the benefit of setting up a UCS and the reason you would do this over just a normal surface picking for fourth axis, usually not a huge deal. But when you start getting into mill turn and five axis, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes, well, when you're basically when you're defining your index, it's just redefining the Z. And sometimes it can do weird things to the X and Y. It's one of these, it, it's just, a, it's a random problem that'll pop up. And when you try and run it in the simulation, you'll start to get errors. If that axis, if that new index that's getting created doesn't sit perfectly, you know, vertical, you know, a kind of, I guess, perpendicular to your axes, then if there's any shift, you know, kind of angular, you know, if you're looking at the part like this, we want all of our indexes coming straight out. If there's any sort of tilt on it, Bobcad's going to read that as a five axis movement. And then when you try and run your simulation, it's going to give you an error. So what I like to do sometimes is create a UCS because sometimes if you go and pick a surface, you might not realize it's not a perfectly flat, straight surface. It might have a slight angle on it. But by going in and setting up an angle and you typing in a UCS over here and do it, setting up the UCS, you won't have that problem where X and Y get any sort of change because you're still defining X and Y. So I could come in here and just say, let's go ahead and pick the 60 degree and then just hit OK. And then now we have our first index there and then our second index right there. So those are the two I'll set up for now. There's going to be more, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and start adding some layers. And I'm just going to say add a new layer. And this is going to be my 2D geometry. Whoops, caps lock still on. Geo. And so when I go and cut this now, wherever we have the index system, that's what we use, just like we use our normal machine setup. So if I want to add toolpath to this index, I right click on that index system. And then we have all pretty much the same options we have uh, just when we right click on our machine setup one. So pretty much think of indexing as the same stuff you always do, except you're you're defining the new 
uh, rotation point. So you're going to have an A move, B move, whatever your machine calls it before it goes and cuts this. So I'm just going to say mill two axis on here and I'm going to say select geometry. And all I'm going to pick for this is the four sides to it. So one, two, three, and four. And I like setting, I'm kind of mixed. I like setting indexes on surfaces if I can, if I know that they're good and clean, uh, just because then it kind of figures out the depth from that surface to the top of the part for me. When we go off the center point, it may not get the top of part or at least the depth set, which actually this one might just be a random half inch because I think it is just a half inch smaller. So that, that you might be able to ignore me on that one. But right here, we got our chain. I'm going to be doing a pocket on it. So yeah, top of feature. So the, to the top is a half inch. Down to there's a half inch. And by picking just this right here, that should be what we cut. So I'll go ahead and hit OK. Now you have options. You can do open pocketing on this. You can do facing. You can do pretty much all the same stuff you normally do. So in this case, I'm actually going to go in and use a uh, facing command. Because if I try and use a pocket, I didn't set up the geometry as an open pocket. So because I didn't set up the geometry for an open pocket, I'd now have to go back, pull the geometry off, and then make some of the lines dotted. And even then, I have to take into account the fact that this is two inches in diameter. So I still need to exit the part far enough to get all the way past this edge. So the pocketing, it would work. We'd probably have to make some geometry bigger, but the facing is going to work a lot better because we can tell it to go off the workpiece and we can tell it a specific distance to come off that workpiece. So I'm going to say facing. And I'll go ahead and just hit next. Now, this is something that just always pops up. It's uh, it's tabs. It's going to be there for every feature you do. It doesn't matter if you're doing four axis or five axis. It's going to give you the option to put a tab on it. Um, really, the only time you're going to be leaving tabs is if you're doing profiles. And that's, I'd say, into that's a specific industry that's doing that kind of stuff anyway. So if you are leaving tabs, you, should, you might not need to be. There's other ways of doing it. Onion skin. Uh, there's a few few ways of doing it. But this isn't something we're ever going to use. So it's just here because it's in every two axis feature. Right here, we've got our posting. So work offset number one, G54. Uh, the output rotary angle would be used for fourth axis. Uh, it's the way we used to do rotations in Bobcad back in... Golly, 20, version 20, 25 and previous, I want to say, 26 maybe even. Um, pretty much what it lets you, what that lets you do is you program the part like you'd normally program it. You'd compute the toolpath and you'd see the toolpath just like you'd normally program it in a standard two axis. But you'd be able to come in here, click this button, and then enter a value. And so what's going to happen with that value is we're just going to put it in the code. You don't see it inside the simulation. You will not see it on the part. That's the problem with this one is it doesn't do any of the work for you. I mean, I, all it's going to do is whatever you create and you say, I want to cut and you enter that rotation angle, it's going to rotate to that and make that cut. So not something I use too often uh, just because it's, it's tough to simulate. It's tough to see what's going on. And so an index system takes care of all that stuff. Uh, the contour ramping output is only going to come into play when you're using a profile rough. So that's your contour ramping pattern. Uh, because it flows, at, because it drops in Z as it cuts, uh, we need to know whether or not whether or not we're allowed to use line moves or arc moves depending on depending on what your post supports. So uh, I'm going to leave it on arc. I'm not even using that toolpath. And then this is the multi-axis posting page. Now, for the most part, you're not going to mess with this page. There is times that you can come in and start changing settings, but but for the most part, you shouldn't have to change anything in here. Um, not with not even so much with fourth axis. When you start getting into some of the mill turn and some of the five axis, this will have some options that you can use to change the way certain things run. Um, one of the big things that's up here is usually an option for for different solutions. So when you start a part off, you know if you try and cut and it says to rotate negative sixty to get over here to cut. Um, you can actually change it to say, instead of starting on this side, let's start on this side and go the other way around instead of going this way around. So the other options that you get, really, that's the only option I ever play with. You can uncheck it and it'll be an option right here. And it says uh, other solution in it. So you can, you, it says first solution or other solution. So you can play around with it. And that'll actually change kind of sometimes where it starts in the direction that it cuts in. Other than that, this contains things like your rotational limits, or if you want all your limits, you can go in here and say, I want all my limits on. That way, you're, as long as your machine is defined correctly for the size of the table 
and everything. With all limits, you're going to get errors on your X, Y, Z, as well as your rotational limits. With just rotational limits, this is the important one for me when I'm working on this because I really just want to find out if that index or whatever it is that I created is nice and straight. If I get an error telling me that it's not made for a fourth axis machine, it usually means that that index that I created has some sort of tilt to it that makes it not sit, you know, par let's say parallel to the tool. I think that's the best way to put it. It's got to be parallel to the tool. When it's not parallel to the tool in any way, Bobcat's going to freak out about it. So right there, you also have some options for angle limits. Uh, if your machine has specific angle limits, um, for your rotary, like this really controls, uh, if you can't do negative values, you go zero to 360 and it'll keep spinning in one direction. So that's kind of inconvenient, but some machines run that way. The other one's limiting from negative 180 to positive 180, uh, on their rotations. Now for fourth axis, most of you guys are going to be running a rotary anyway, so it's not going to be a big deal. You probably won't have any limits on it, but when you start getting into five axis and the milling and the mill turn side of it, you will have limitations on how, how far you can rotate some of those things. So other than that, I'm going to just use the machine settings and then hit next. And then right here we get our, our tool. So this is where we get to set up what facing tool we'd like to use. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, half inch diameter actually works fine. Uh, that pocket there is only, I think, an inch wide or so. So it's not too bad. We'll go with a half inch flat. I'm really not messing with the feed rates. Got the tool numbering and the coolant here. I just want to mention, if any of you guys have through the spindle coolant. Uh, it's not something that comes standard from Bobcat. We got flood, mist, air, and oil. Uh, if you have flood, or if you have through the spindle coolant, contact the tech guys and they can get it added to your post. Uh, I just had a guy that was talking about it. He didn't think there was a way to program it. He's just been going in and typing the commands in by hand. But yeah, we can put those in. We can turn them on. Um, we'll even give you what it, what we essentially do is give you a second little posting page here. So you'd have a second, it says advanced posting on it. And, uh, it would let you turn on the options for, uh, for your coolant for high, through the spindle. And it would also give you the ability to do, uh, your normal flood coolant. So if you guys are cutting any sort of, you know, titaniums or any of that stuff where you just really want to flood the part, uh, you can kind of double up the coolant on it if your machine allows for that. So. All right, right here for the patterns. I'm going to go ahead and do a zigzag. Um, I'll, I'll keep it that way. I'll say let's go off the work piece. And if we go one inch in either direction, I should be fine. It should That should be plenty to get, uh, to get all the way through. So I'll try that one out. I'm going to tell it to go along the Y axis because I want the tool to go back and forth this way instead of along the X, which is that way. Um, but you could also do a custom direction. Uh, step over amount, I'm just going to do 50%. Right here for the parameters, I definitely need to do multiple passes. So I'm going to say multiple steps and I'll just do eighth inch at a time. You know, nothing too crazy. Next, we then have the leads. So just how do we get into the part? Uh, this one's really nice because it lets me set up a parallel lead. And so I can set up a parallel lead and then I like to make the length uh, half the tool. That should set it off the part even a little bit further. Uh, so that when we plunge down, we're not entering, we're not plunging into the material. So I'll leave it at that quarter inch and then hit next. Uh, right here for the links. So we got direct links, which are going to connect just with a straight line. Or we can do an arc. Sabrina, please come to my office. Sabrina. Hold on, guys. New package area. Muted. There we go. All right. So we got arcs we could do on the end as well. So just like that. And then it wraps around. The max link gap is just the just how big of a gap we we recognize. And then right here's the advanced feed rates. I haven't messed with this too much in real life, but uh, we have convert rapids to feeds. This allows you to convert uh, your rapid moves to feed rates. So you'd actually output a G01 on your rapid moves with a feed rate at the end of it. And then the other ones are for your lead in and lead out. If you wanna slow down that lead in or slow down that lead out when it's entering or exiting, you can slow it down. Uh, Randy, it's telling me that you raised your hand. I don't know if that means uh, if you meant to. Uh, I don't know if you, if you have a question. It says It says your hand's raised. So I think I can clear it, but I don't know. If you got a problem, let me know. Oh, just kidding. Yeah, I, I figured you didn't mean to. I think it's been there for a while. <laughs> so you can see right here after hitting compute, I probably went a little further than I needed to uh, with that one inch. Uh, I could definitely shorten that up. Let's go ahead and edit this. 
jump down here and just say, let's go bass by a half inch or so. So we'll hit compute. Really what I want to see is that the tool path kind of exits the stock here and uh, yeah, starts over there. looks great. So now from this point, we have a few ways to get the rest of that hex done. Now I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to do it two different ways. One would be the full index method, which if I was to continue doing it is how we'd want to do it. Um, but I have uh, right here. So we have our second index and I've already created a tool path that's doing what I want it to do. So I could just make an index all the way around and then copy this feature. So I can come down here, say copy, and then right click on the next index system and then just paste the feature right there. So right there. So we'll say it asks us, hey, do you want to use the same top and depth? We should be using the exact same top and depth because, well, that's what we're grabbing here. So I'm going to say yes. And then I'm just going to expand the index here. I don't know why, but sometimes it doesn't expand it when you paste it. So there we go. And then I'll right click on the geometry, say reselect. And I'll just go in and pick all four pieces of this. Now I can tell you now the, the uh, depth of this, the height of this looks a little off. And I think it's because our index is down at the bottom. So I'm going to say pick top and I'm going to just pick over here. And so that's the depth there. So it says, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. That's what's happening. So I'm just going to go in and say top is should be one inch. And then this should be a depth of a half inch. And that should be the right depth because it was going from the center here. My stock's two inches thick. And so I'll go ahead and just hit OK and then compute that tool path. And just by computing, copy, paste and compute, it's going to recognize that new index and cut it that way. So there we have it. So that'll be one way of doing it. And that's how you do it. Like on these two right back here, that's how I'm gonna do it in a few minutes. But with something like this, where I have six of the same exact cuts happening, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete this, this entire uh, index actually. So I'll just additional functions and then just say delete, yes. So that'll get rid of that tool path. Now what I wanna do is I wanna just turn off this CAD geometry that I got right here. And I want to create a line, just a line that runs right down the middle of the part. So I'm just going to go to create 2D, say line. And then I'm just going to say started at X, Y, or let's go started at X minus one. And then we'll have it end at X. Uh, I'll go nine, just because that'll take us to the other side of the part because the part's about eight inches long. So there we have it just like that, just a line down the center. So what that allows me to do is now I can right click on this feature two axis here. Let me rename this, this will be hex cut. And so right here I can then come in, right click on that and go down to add toolpath pattern. So I say add toolpath pattern. Right over here I can choose the rotate option. Now the, the toolpath pattern for fourth axis, there's really only the one you're gonna use. It's probably gonna be the rotate. Uh, but you do have the options of doing an array, a translation, and even move to uh, different points when you're cutting this thing. So I'm going to come in and say, let's rotate and then say next. And I want to make sure to choose the 3D option. If you're not getting this option, if you ever try and do this and you don't get that 3D option, uh, it's usually because of the, the license. It depends on what's on your license. Um, I had some guys that were trying to do it. They were manually going to turn the part, but they didn't want to have to program all six sides. They were just going to uh, try and get it all in one and then manually rotate the part in between because they didn't have uh, equipped fourth axis, I guess is a, the best way to say it. They didn't have the rotate option. So they just ended up doing it by hand and running the same code like I told them anyway. But now what we have to figure out is the angle that we need to rotate around. So it's 360 degrees divided by however many sides of that. Uh, well, in this case, my hex. So, if, But if you had an octagon or something or a, a pentagon, it would be 360 divided by eight or 360 divided by five. So in this case, 360 divided by six, not 0 0.360. 360 divided by six gives me that 60 degree angle in between each. Now I already have one tool path done. And if you guys remember, I think I say it almost every time we do this, uh, do this thing and I start talking about copies and stuff. When you're talking copies, you have whatever you've created. So where you're, uh, let's say you have your total. So I need six total cuts. I've made one. So whatever's the difference between those two, that's what I put for copies. So my copies is going to be five. And then from here for the rotation axis, this is the reason I drew that line right down the middle of the part. So this is going to define the, the line that this needs to rotate around. So I'm going to say pick for the start. I'm going to go ahead and just pick this point right here and then hit OK. And then I'll go say pick for the end. I'm going to go right down here and pick the end right there. 
then hit okay. And the reason I do that is just because I can probably figure out these depths, but I've gotten parts that just give me weird results, even when I think I can enter the values properly. So I just come in and put a line down the middle and then pick it, then hit okay. And now we have all six of those things getting done. So I made a really nice star. <laughs> all right, so I'll go ahead and blank that thing out. And then I just shrink it up. So then we can go ahead and turn our CAD back on and move on to the next feature. So next feature is gonna be these pockets. Uh, same kind of thing. I'm gonna start with an index system. So this time I'll go ahead and say additional functions, add index. Uh, this time I'm gonna pick a surface. So I'll pick right there and then hit okay. And then for this one, so I can rename these. So I could call this hex index. And then I'll just rename this one. We'll call it pocket index. Dang it. My microphone's in front of my keyboard. All right, there we go. So now we have the, I, did, I guess I didn't click off that one. Whatever. So the pocket index, I can right click, just do a mill two axis. So I'm going to mill two axis, select geometry. I'll pick the floor right there. Uh, total height's fine. It's going right from the top there. So I might be cutting a little air on the outsides here. I'm not too worried about that. So it should be 0.5 to 0.5, and then I'll hit OK. Next, there's our preview of the part. Clearance plane, rapid plane, feed plane, all that fun stuff. You're pretty much treating this like a standard two-axis pocket. Uh, the only difference between this and a normal pocket is it's going to rotate in the middle. So I'll just do a uh, half inch to rough it. I think that'll fit in there. We'll find out. Yeah, it should. I think it's one inch wide. And then I'll switch it up to a quarter inch when we go and finish it. So remember when you're talking about your pockets now with this version 31, we've added a bunch more pocketing uh, routines. The standard pockets are, are exactly that. They're standard. They cannot do anything special other than use, sp uh, use spirals for circular pockets. But the advanced pocket has the has more options. So uh, one big thing about the advanced pocket, they can this thing can open pocket with any of these. So the tool can leave the part as long as you define it with a dotted line where it's allowed to leave, the tool will actually leave the part. And you can do that inside your fourth axis as well. In this case, I'm gonna go with just a pocket out. It's not nothing too crazy. The standard and the advanced should be about the same with this one. Uh, but other than that, I'm not doing anything special. I'm not doing any rest roughing or any weird step overs or anything like that. For the parameters here, I have my side allowance. This is the amount of material that I wanna save for the finish pass. So I'll leave it at 15 thousandths. And then again, I'm just gonna come in, do multiple steps. I'll stick with that eighth inch for now and we'll kind of see how it goes. For the leads, we got a plunge. So we can plunge right into the part. We can ramp into that part or we can even do a spiral into the part just depending on how we wanna enter that material, whatever we're comfortable with. And uh, ever since version 30, every single plunge option in the system has the ability to peck or fast peck. So I'm not gonna do anything fancy. We'll go next right here to the machine sequencing. Uh, machine sequencing, this would just be the order we cut anything in. Uh, really not important when we're only cutting one pocket though. If we were cutting like that picture showed nine different pockets, that's how we can sort it. Here's our links. So it's just when we link from one cut to the next, do we make it a direct cut, an S link? or do we do a retract? And then down here is when we move from kind of one side of the part to the other, do we do a direct, do we make an S-link, or do we retract? So there we go. Next, we got our advanced feed rates. So we have our general overrides, let us convert our rapids to feeds. Uh, we could change the linking feed rate, and we could also change the adaptive, uh, the adaptive feed rate. So we could go from a standard normal feed rate to a volume-based machining. So you can actually go in and based on the tool engagement, the volume of material that the tool's uh, cutting, we could actually slow it down or speed it up depending on what's needed. So you'll get that. You'll even get more options if you start jumping into like the adaptive roughing here, you'll start getting radial chip thinning and all those fun settings as well. So definitely something you could look into in the future. So I'll go there, keep it standard for now. Uh, just to finish, I'm just going to swap it out for a quarter inch tool. Um, just want to make sure that the length of it, the flute length is actually, that'd be fine. I should be fine. This is only going a half inch deep. So that should be good. We'll hit next. This is a finish pass. So there's really not too much to actually do here. Uh, I'm just going to go next again, leave it on system comp left. Parameters, not really making any changes. Like I said, finish pass. So we're just trying to get the part done. Leads, I'll do a nice little circular lead in 
And uh, I like to make the length and the radius half the tool diameter. So whatever the radius of the tool is, I just enter it right there. That's usually small enough to fit on the part. Um, the thing is, if you're not using um, machine compensation uh, and you're working on the inside of the part, the only benefit to this is it's not going to plunge down even close to the wall. It's going to be a little further away. But if you're using system compensation, we're never going to plunge down right on the wall anyway. So, but definitely a benefit to having some sort of leads in there. Uh, corner types, just not going to mess with anything here. These are just for external corners. We can make them, uh, make them sharp or we could change how the tool interpolates those corners, make them round. Uh, not, uh, I don't want to say that. They, it does not round the corners. All it does is changes how the tool actually interpolates it. So the corner is still going to be sharp. It's just a different way of the tool getting around that corner. Uh, a little bit easier on the tool when you round it out. Right here is the machine sequencing. Uh, this is, again, just the order we're cutting these things in. And then the advanced feed rates one last time. When I'm all done, I can go ahead and hit compute. And it should be pretty quick. Which pocket did I use? A, a normal offset pocket. Oh, it wasn't standard. It, the other one. So there it is right there. Pretty straightforward. I want to go in here and just edit this. Jump back up to the parameters. I'm going to do the offset pocket out, but I'm going to drop this to like a 35% step over. And that'll give me an extra cut down the middle. That way I can be a little bit uh, a little bit less aggressive on here. So same thing with this. It's the, it's the same kind of situation. We could go in, we could set up this index system, uh, or we've already set up the index system. We could go in make another index system to do the pocket on the bottom side, or I could do the same thing, come in and say, add a tool path pattern, rotate it, and then just pick my 3D option and say 180 degrees with one copy. And then again, just pick up my line. So turn on the 2D geo, and then I can turn this off for now. And I'll just pick that point there. And then for the end, I will pick that point right there and then hit okay. And then once again, just hit OK, and that'll put the opposite on there. So if we look at the part compared to that, we now have those two. So indexing is pretty straightforward. If you guys have more questions on the indexing, let me know. I'm going to skip this one for now. If we got time at the end, I will get this one done. But I want to jump over to this part here because there's a lot more. Uh, not really. It's it's uh, The four-axis rotary toolpath is a pretty straightforward toolpath. If you used any of the kind of three-axis toolpaths before, it's kind of the same setup as that. It might be a little bit different, but it's it's pretty close to that. So I'm just going to go in here, and I'm just going to go down to mill four-axis rotary. So I'm going to pick that. Now from here, I'm just going to select my geometry. And with this one, it's not. This is a big difference. It's not like the three-axis. You don't pick the entire part every time. You can if you're trying to cut the entire thing. But in this case, I want to start with this fillet right here, and then just cut my way across. So I'm just picking all this geometry. Making sure I get everything in there just because, well, I don't want to leave anything out. So I want to grab all that, that, and I'll go all the way down to that chamfer there. So that should be good. And then I'll go ahead and hit OK. Next. Now, top of features at one inch, and it's at one inch. The part is two inches in diameter, and the origin's right down the center. So from the origin to get up to the top where, we're, where we selected this geometry, one inch difference. Next, right there, we have our fourth axis rotary. And uh, the available operations are a fourth axis rotary. So you can do more than one, especially since there's really two ways to run this. You could have it set up to run uh, along the part like so or around the part like so. And I've seen many people that, that'll run along on one and around on another and they'll do it all in one feature because the geometry is the same. So unless you change the geometry, you could put as many fourth axis rotaries in here as you want uh, just to make them cut. So next, right there. So posting, we got our just work offset number one. We'll go right here, multi-axis posting again. And then right here for the fourth axis, we get to start playing with the tool. So on this one, I'm thinking I'm going to try and use, I don't remember how big I made these. So I'm going to go with a quarter inch ball mill. We can always make an adjustment. Like I said at the beginning, I haven't programmed this part. You guys have never seen this part because I made it up this morning. And uh, yeah, so there's there's always going to be some tweaks you're going to make. So if this tool's too small, we'll check it in the simulation. If it's too small, we can make an adjustment. We can make it bigger. Maybe go with a three ace ball, or if we can get away with a half inch ball, which we might be able to. I can't remember if those are half inch or I don't remember what I made them. So yeah, yeah that happens. So tool number, coolant, feeds and speeds, all right there. We'll go next. 
the patterns. Now, I'm going to do one as a long just to show what it kind of looks like and kind of how everything's going to be working. Um, so I'll do an along here. I'll tell it to I'll tell it to zigzag. It'll get rid of a lot of the rapids that we normally see. Uh, and I'm not going to I just don't want to mess with that right there. So the side shift would let you shift the tool off center, whatever distance you want. So you're using more of the side of the tool for machining. I want to go right with the tip of the tool. Uh, my rotary axis is my X axis. And uh, this is where you start getting into some of these options for five axis. So point tool to rotary axis. That's going to be um, right around the, the rotary, but I shouldn't have to set anything up here. The base points X, Y, Z, zero. If I did have a five axis or a fifth axis, I could come in and actually put an angle on it and lock it at that angle while it goes and cuts this. Down here, we got our cut direction clockwise or counterclockwise. And then right here's the angular start and end. So this allows us to define if there, if we just want to cut a certain percentage of this or a certain angle of this, you can go and enter in that angle. Uh, not something I want to do. I don't want to not, I, I don't want to, I don't need to avoid any of that stuff. What I need to do is start the part a little bit later, which will be this one right here. So right here we have our step angle. So I'm going to do a step every, yeah, I will do one degree. We'll see how that comes out. A step every one degree. Um, the allowance, I'm not too worried about it. I'm not going to leave any allowance for now. And then our tolerance, I'm just going to leave it at half a thou. That's a pretty good number to be at. The only change you'd really ever make to that is would be from changing it from a half a thou to a thou. Uh, it'll take longer to calculate, but the tool path may be a lot cleaner when you get it done. So there's a few ways, you know, there's, there's benefits to it, but I usually leave it there. It's, it's been a pretty good spot to leave it so far. Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. And then down here we have our cut or ignore holes and then a long rotary axis. So if you've, if you've used any of the three axis tool paths, you always have a top and bottom of job right here. In this one, you're not defining a top or a bottom. You're kind of defining where you want to start it on the length and where you want to end it on the length. So I'm going to say, let's start. Oh, golly. I don't remember where I put it. Um, I think six inches would be fine. Let's try six inches down. So I'll say start at six. Let's end at, uh, let's end at nine. If it, uh, it might have, it might have to change that to eight. We'll find out. Uh, I don't have any stock to trim to anyway, so I'm not going to trim to any stock there. And then multiple passes. This is probably something we should do, but, and here's the thing I do. I don't set it up right now. I want to see if when I cut this part, it's going to look right. I want to make sure if I'm even on the right, right place. Uh, yes, Randy, I've asked them for a pick on these ones. They added it into the, um, to the three axis where you can pick the start and the end or the top and the bottom of the job. Uh, this one's really annoying because I don't usually take those measurements. And if, you know, like in a case like this, I made this whole part up uh, just before lunch and I don't remember, I didn't draw it or I didn't write anything down. I just started making things. And so now I don't remember where that starts, but I can pull a measurement off of it. I made it eight, eight inches long so I could figure that stuff out. Um, so I'll go six to nine right now. Let's go six to eight. That's as far as it should go out anyway. Now, I really should be doing multiple passes on this for sure. Um, we got a pretty hefty cut there. You know, I've been taking it pretty easy on everything else. I should probably take it easy here as well. But I'm not going to do that from the start. I like to wait. I like to see what my simulation gives me, kind of see the finish to it, and then add a, add a roughing pass to that. Because if you do a, if you get a good result, it's not going to do anything but add toolpath away from that good result. So it's going to keep the floor or however you finish it at wherever it's at. And then this is actually going to come in and, and just rough out the material. So the finish should still be the same. So I'm not going to turn it on for now. We'll go see the simulation and then, uh, yeah, we'll see what we get. So next, right here's our leads. Just how do we get into that material? So we got plunge. Again, there's the, the pecking options. Uh, ramp, spiral, and then with the plunge, we could do a vertical, parallel, right angle, or circular lead in. Uh, next, we got our options. Not too much here. Uh, you can tell it's only going to do the, um, it's only going to do either tool tip or tool center. So there's really not too much to it. If you're programming, programming off the tool center, uh, you shouldn't be usually. That's a CNC machine, but you can. It's there. Next, we have our, oh, come on now. Links. Uh, so this will let us just, it's just linking from one cut to the next. Do we follow the surface? Do we go direct? Do we make an S link between the two or do we do a retract right here? 
what'd you say, John? Can you post this Bobcad file so I can reference the part with all the axes and toolpaths? I can. I'll have to email it to you because this thing doesn't let me do a handout of one of my part files and it won't let me do a zip file for some reason. Um, so I don't know of a way to get it to you right away. I can email it to you, John. Give me your uh, give me your email real fast. Just put it in there. Hey, there it is. I got it. Uh, give me one second, fellas. I got it right here. I can. It's even faster than last week when I had to send one out. It, does anyone else want this thing? Just post post your uh, post your thing. Copy that to the clipboard. To that. All right. We, we're gonna have to wait one second, John. It's not letting me send it, but I will get this out to you today, just before before we end this whole thing. So right here, there's the links. Uh, next, we then have the gouge check. So I have a I I treat gouge check a little bit differently than a lot of guys. <laughs> I'm just getting a bunch of emails just sent into my into my question box right now. Hold on, let me clean this up a little bit. All right, so that'll be fine. Um, so I don't do gouge checking the way that a lot of people think gouge checking should be done. I do it based on uh, if I need it or not, really. I, I watch the simulation, and if I see a problem, then I'm going to put the um, gouge check on it if there's no other way for me to fix it. When I start talking about three axis pro tool paths and the gouge checking inside of there, I usually don't mess with that because, well, I don't know until it's until I see the whole thing. So I like to leave it the way it is for now, uh, just blank. But if we do need something, we have the ability to do that. So right there. Uh, next. All right. Yeah, you guys, I got a whole bunch of them. I'll send it out at the end. I didn't realize this many people wanted my my junky little part here, but it's a good one, I guess. Uh, plus, there's a video for it of me cutting it. So. I'll send all these out uh, right probably as soon as I stop the recording in a few minutes. I'll get them out to you. I got uh, looks like seven of you guys that want one. So right here, just the same things. We got the convert rapids to feeds and then the lead in and lead out. And then we can hit compute. Oh, I thought I got scared there. Screen turned black. All right. So how do I copy all these things? So this, this, copy. It won't let me paste for some reason. I don't want to type all those out. Hey, look, there it is. So you can see, I think, uh, so six is probably a little too far, uh, as you can see here, because I don't have a way to pick it, like Randy was requesting, which I've been, I, I would I would kill for that. It'd be great. Um, so if I look, it starts right at about, uh, I'd say we want to start at about, we'll say five, five and a half, I'll say. Let's go in here, just edit this, add that extra half inch onto it. Whoops. And say, let's go to 5.5. All right, let that thing run. Why won't you get me the copy email address to clipboard? Paste. I don't know what's going on. Paste. Yeah, I got nothing. All right, I'll have to figure that out in a minute. So that looks a lot better. We got it going a little further down. I did not pick all the geometry down here, so that could be screwing that up. But I really don't even like the fact that it's cutting this way. That's not the way I would want to cut it. I'd really want to do it with a finer step over. So let's go into this feature. Well, let's check it out in the simulation real fast. So this will show us, should be everything inside the simulation. So we'll run it here. And hopefully it loads. I got, uh, I think this... This program that we use for running the meeting is a real hefty run program because it seems to slow my stuff down every time. All right. Looked like toolpath was offset. Did I put it here? Let's see what it looks like here. That's what I was thinking. It did look kind of strange. But here's one of the indexes. So it's just going to cycle through doing all these. Um, must have a finish. Pa I do have a finish pass coming in, I think. Right. Leaving 15 thousandths on that wall. No, I don't have a finish pass. All right, no biggie. We'll figure that out. Looks like I got a cut. No, that's two there. Oh, it's the chamfer. <laughs> I haven't cut the chamfer yet. So there it goes. So there's that guy there. Then we'll switch up. We'll switch to this inside section. So it's going to pocket that guy out. And I did set it up to do a finish pass. Those are quarter inch radiuses. So a, a nice uh, tool path there, there, and then right here. <laughs> Oh, is it ugly? Yeah, I'm definitely clipping something off right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go change my geometry selection. Now that I've defined 
where I want to cut a little bit more, you can see it's overextending into there. And the reason it's going in is that's why right there. So you can see how it's kind of wrapping around that. It's because when I picked my geometry, I didn't pick that surface. And there's a reason why I didn't pick it and I just wasn't thinking. The reason I didn't pick it is notice if I touch this section, it picks up this whole section. So that would normally tell Bobcad to do the entire um, the entire cut. But now by limiting it to the five and a half to eight, we should be golden. So let's go ahead and hit OK on that now. And then we'll recompute the toolpath and see if this now stays outside of it. That's kind of the same same thing. Measure on that seam. Measure one on that seam. What are you talking about, Randy? What seam? Hold on, let this thing compute. There we go. Just like that. So I think even where we're starting might be a little bit further than I need. What did I go to? I went to... Oh, hold on. 5.625 should be the number. All right. This is it. That should start pretty much right in the middle of that thing, I think. If I did this correct this time evaluate measure one to get the actual number oh yeah you're right yeah you're 100 percent right randy don't judge me all right right here we'll go evaluate so randy's saying go in here take a measurement right there and we could find out yeah five and a half gets us there i don't want to be right on that so i'll shift it over that should be fine so five and a half which was right that's what we had before and then uh, yeah i want to shift it over just a little bit i don't need to cut there but there we go so got that cancel that all right I, hold on give me one second i got to get rid of the messages that don't have emails in them so doug doug wants it uh randy randy you tried to catch me while i was in the middle of that uh all right and then there we go so everything i got left is all the emails all right cool so there we go randy it looks like it's uh cutting better everyone not just randy randy's the one that called me out on it so uh he gets the he gets the glory if you want to call it that uh, all right, right here. So I want to go over here to the cam tree and jump into the simulation one more time. Now we shouldn't be doing that huge gouge into the part. Uh, so we'll fast forward through to the four axis rotary here and uh, we'll see how it cuts. Now, again, this one's going along. I wouldn't I probably wouldn't cut it this way, but we have other options. So we're going to look at those other options here in a second. So right there and then four axis rotary. And I'm just gonna go over here real fast, turn off, I wanna turn off the workpiece for now. We're gonna turn it back on in a second, but just see how it cuts. Golly, is that ugly. I don't like it, but we'll let it run. So as you can see, probably not the way we wanna cut this thing, but we're also not gonna get a, a perfect view of it right now. Um, partially, it's just the simulation. While it's running, it always gives you, um, it always gives you a weird cut. We say, Randy, do we have time to add some side shift? Yeah, we can add some side shift. I'll add it in a few minutes. Let me finish this guy off. And then uh, when I stop the recording, we'll do some side shift stuff, play around with it. I I got no time after this other than right after this is normally my break. So we're good. I can spend a few minutes on this stuff um, right there. So it's going around, cleaning up. If I, I'm going to pause it here and just kind of fast forward and see. Um, you really don't get a full view of the part until... It's done, and then down at the bottom, you'll see the automatic quality improvement pop up. And when that finishes, that's where you'll start to see the actual finish on the part. So that looks pretty decent. Uh, actually, not as not not too shabby. I don't hate it. Now let's see what it does when we go around. So I'm just going to come in here, close that off, and then we'll edit this. And so really, the big change I got to make here is I just want to change from along to around which I'll just keep it going with. The, I'll keep this one going with a zig. That'll keep everything going in the same direction. And then right here, now we don't have an angle. We have a step over. So um, I don't know. Let's go with uh, 10 thou. We'll try that. Uh, we do have an adaptive step over, which would let you add a minimum step over. So in a case like this, I could go in and say 5 thou. And what's nice about this is we go 10 thou. So the average, the normal um, cuts that we do would be at the 10 thou. But if Bobcad sees that there's areas we could add a little bit more to, we can, uh, we could have it go to a minimum of, uh, to a minimum of 5 thou. You can go smaller than that as well. Uh, so we should be starting and ending at the same point. Other than that, we ain't got much else to set. So I'll hit compute. Do, 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 do. OK, 
come on now. Anyone got any big uh, big plans for Christmas? Going on a big travel? Anything like that? Something fun? You can just comment it if you want. I'm not doing nothing. I'm sitting here. In, well, I'm in Florida, so it's not too bad anyway. Uh, yeah, just, just compute. There we go. All right. <laughs> Going to cut some Fs on a mill turn. That's what Randy's doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a file I sent him earlier today to uh, to test some stuff out that we've been fighting with for. I don't. I've lost track of how long it's been. It's it's been so long. I absolutely hate mill turn machines because of it. Um, when I when it gets going again, I'll probably I'll probably do it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's cold. Yeah, come on down, man. We're in Clearwater. I mean, it's it's not cold here, but for us Floridians, it's brutal. It's been pretty bad lately. And I, I'm not a native Floridian. I didn't think I was uh, this much of a weakling. But over the past year or so, uh, it's the cold has, it's, I don't know, I've become just more of a wuss. I don't know. I hate it now. I can't stand it. Everything about it. All right. So it's cutting in. Slow it down. Normally, the tool wouldn't be moving. But this gives us the best view of kind of how this thing's going to cut. And, uh, and we'll just see how it cuts down this. So. I, I actually didn't hate the result on the last one. It was pretty clean. I thought it would leave more jagged edges on here. But like I said, you can't judge this right now. You can't uh, You can't base it on that. This is a rewind that's happening. So when it hit 10,000, it did a rewind. That's how my post is set. So like you can't judge it now. You got to wait till it finishes when it does the automatic cleanup. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this. Fast forward all the way down. And we'll get there soon enough. Take a drink while I'm waiting. Scott, I'm a Minnesota fan, man. That's I, I've been to Minnesota. That was the second state I ever spent time in. My uh, my whole family's Minnesota Vikings fans. Uh, we used to drive from Chicago to Minnesota to watch the Bears and Minnesota game every year uh, at the Dome. Haven't been to, well. I, I've been to the new stadium when I was there on a trip for Bobcat. I, I saw it. Haven't actually gone into the new stadium or seen a game yet though. There it is. They both came out pretty good. Um, they, I, I, I don't know which one I prefer. They, they both came out pretty decent. Um, I guess we'd have to really start, you know, I really kind of base this on the time. Uh, if I'm all right with the result on that, if we look here now, I didn't do anything with the, with the, Feeds and speeds. So what we get out of this should be the same feeds and speeds. So I'm going to generate a setup sheet here, just the full setup sheet. And uh, this will give me the cycle time that I want to see. So we see if five hours and 17 minutes. Oh, we're only cutting at six inches a minute. But that's still something we can use. So I can use that, that number to come in now. I can edit this back to going along. So I'll just go back to along make sure my st uh, my settings stay the same, which they do, and then compute it. And then we'll go ahead and regenerate this one. And uh, yeah, so right here, what was the time? It was, oh man, five hours, 17, 5, 17, 28. So 5, 17, 28. Let me edit this because that is not the way I would cut that if I could get away with it. Uh, compute that again. So get rid of all those extra rapids. Yeah, Randy, you can totally dictate that. It's uh, right here in the patterns page, clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, be of help when using side shift so we can drag the tool through the material instead of pushing it through. Yeah, clockwise or counterclockwise. That's just going to determine there. So, all right, let me, uh, I think I got it done. So five, five, seventeen, twenty-eight. I'm just trying to remember it just in case this clears out my old sheet. Uh, it should just open up a second tab. Yeah, there we go. So 4.15.52. So here's the first right here. Yeah, so you're talking an hour of time shaved off, shaved off by going along. Now, you'd have to play around with that and find out if the surface finish is going to be good enough for you. But uh, I'd probably take the one that's 4.15 if the finish is good enough. So I like it. And this one, and this, this, this uh, four axis where it's actually doing around the part, your machine, a lot of rotaries are going to have a limitation where they can only count up so high. Um, and so when it counts up real high, you know, when it hits 10,000, it might have to rewind to keep track of where it's at. So, um, yeah, there it is. 
that's pretty much where I'm going to end. So Randy wants to talk about some side shift and stuff. I'll keep the recording going. And I didn't mean to uh, to call you guys or to miss you guys. John and Larry, you guys sound like you're going to have the most fun out of anyone. Uh, beer and pizza, guys. That's what they're doing for Christmas. Beer and pizza. Uh, that sounds that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so if you guys, well, my my wife would let me never let me show up there. Sorry, guys. I'd love to make it, but. Couldn't happen. All right. So we got the fourth axis on there now. So now you want to go in with the side shift, Randy? Let's do some side shift. You want to do, me, leave, put me one message on this type of direction. We, okay. So let me delete that one. I answered that. Answered that. Shooting to shooting steel at a mile, drinking afterwards. Hell yeah, Brian. That sounds like fun. Um, all right. 500 to start with. Now, what? My, my tool's only a quarter inch. You still want me to do it with that tool, Randy? You think that's going to be good? All right, let me delete some of these other messages here. For everyone that doesn't care about the side shift or, or anything, I am going to be, I'm going to talk about it here for a second. I'm um, just trying to clean up my messages. So I got all you guys that want this emailed to you. Uh, I'm not coming to Minnesota anytime soon. Sorry. Um, I'd like to cut at 45 degrees so the tip of the tool doesn't have to do all the cutting. I gotcha. All right, so we got a ball mill here. So side shift would be, hey, you want it at 45 degrees? Yeah, half. Let's think here. We're, at, we're two inches wide, half inch over that way. Yeah, that should be pretty good. Half inch should be pretty good. Now we want to go, do you want to, we want to go around though, right, Randy? Or do we want to go along? Does a long work? Yeah, along would still work, right? I don't know. I don't side shift too often. I'm going to hit compute around. I knew it. Son of a gun. All right. So we'll go around. I'm glad Randy's here because I don't use side shift. So we'll go around side shift a half uh, quarter inch tool. Next. Anything else we got to change? 10 thou minimum. Uh, all looks good. So we'll hit compute. See how this thing looks. All right. Get rid of that one. Man, some of you guys are going to be doing some pretty fun stuff. I will be shooting guns, which will be fun. On, but it'll be Christmas Eve. That's what we do every Christmas Eve. Um, so, yeah. Shooting some stuff. Go ahead and Dustin and I to the list. Oh, add you and Dustin to the list. Okay. Send me it to... Jeez, everyone wants this stupid little part I made. I didn't realize it'd be such a hit. I made these with Tauruses, just so you guys know, because I never use Tauruses, so I was trying to figure out a way to use them. Just, uh, just a way of way of doing it. So there we got it. You want me to run the sim? Let me turn off these indexes. We don't need to see none of that junk. Post yes, no. Post yes, no. Launch simulation. Give her a second. She's getting old. Let's make the part rotate in the simulation. I can do that. I just have to go shift the, sto the stock out of the rotary. I was avoiding showing you guys the machine the whole time because I forgot to do this earlier. Let me just shift it out. I'll go work offset. Uh, we should be X minus. I think it's a minus 10. Let me go minus 10 or so. And then uh, hit OK. So that's just to shift the part out of the rotary uh, inside the simulation. Because when we put, when we build these machines virtually, we don't zero them the same way your machine actually zeroes out at, on your actual machine. So when you're talking about the zero position for the rotary or or anything, it's everything's all kind of centered up on it. So the problem with this now is if I didn't factor everything incorrectly which I did not, I can already tell you that, this <laughs> may collide with this. So we may, I might have to add a little bit more of a shift, more stock, whatever we need to do. Um, but yeah, here we go. So I'll slow it down because this might go a little quick and see how it looks. So it's coming down right there, Randy. Let me just do this. Let me go to a uh, right side, left side view, left side view. So that's where it's coming down. All 
I just want to see if the tool is dragging through the material or pushing. Uh, with this rotation, that would be pushing through the material. Or no, right? Oh, no, it's dragging. T tool's turning this way. Never mind. <laughs> so, yeah, you'd have that. You'd be able to do the shift. And then if it's going the wrong way whenever, you know, just flip-flop it. Um, yeah, cool, cool. And so that does that. Give me one second. Michael, you popped up just... Just a second ago. I've been manually adding one degree rotation by hand every zigzag. Do you not have a fourth axis? Or is that what do you mean, Mike? Mike, that's how you that's how you've been doing your cut. You program it, make a single cut, rotate it, make a single cut, rotate it, make a single cut back. I've done that before. It's just not fun. Uh, I had to do that with a customer who didn't have a fourth axis. Uh, let's speed this thing up so we actually see some results here. I have it. Uh, I must have it on zigzag. Uh, it looks like I do. Should have put it on zig so it would just keep going around. Because now, Randy, I'm getting a push and a pull. So, how would you position the part? Wait, how would you position the part out from the chuck so it doesn't crash the chuck? The big thing there is you got to have stock long enough. Now we don't have chuck jaws on here, so you got to picture how long your jaws would be sticking out. And then what you do to shift it, I can leave that running, is you go into the machine setup and just edit. So right on the right on the main, the last final page of the machine setup, John, you can go up right here to the work offset and you could tell it how far you want to pull that away from the chuck. So if you're setting your origin where I did, which is zero right on the end, dead center there, you'll put your shift in enough that it's clear of the chucks, you know, clear far enough away. Um that it's safe. And then from there, you can kind of take a measurement. If, if you made, like, I think I made this stock, uh, I think, what was it? 10, 10 inches, nine, 10 inches long. I think I made it 10 inches long. So I might have to get an 11 inch or a 12 inch piece of stock just to hold on to it. You know, live center. There, there'd be a lot of stuff we'd have to start to factoring in when we start sticking stuff out that far. But this is where you'd be able to put the shift in there and then we could hit. Okay. Now the whole reason it does this is because on this machine, when we set every axis to zero, so there's X zero, there's uh, Y zero, and then Z zero, and I go and turn off the tool, and I turn off the stock. What it that's how that's how the virtual machine zero is. Uh, that's how the virtual machine zero is set up. So when, that's that's what we're shifting away, and that's. This is the reason why the part shows up inside the rotary when we do this, because we're telling it the, excuse me, when we're setting up the origin, we're setting up the zero location. So we put the zero location from the part in the same zero location as the machine. And so that just puts the stock in. So that work shift is going to let you move it out um, to just move over. Michael Arms, tell Cody if he's not busy, my Bobcat just locked up, will not close or anything. Stay on here for one sec for me, Mike. We'll uh, we'll see if I can't log in there real quick in a minute. Give me a, give me a few minutes. Uh, I don't know where Cody's at. He's in a different office. So, uh, okay. So add minus two to X, and that would yeah. So if you like, right now I'm at minus ten. So that brings me out from the front face of my part ten inches. My stock happens to be ten inches, so that puts me the back of the part flush right there. If I went to negative twelve inches, the 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 butt of my part, the end of my part of my stock would be two inches further from this chuck than it already is. So, yeah. All right. There we go. All right. What do you say, Randy? I know I skipped over. You give me one second. John, John, if you got anything else, let me know. Mike, I'm going to keep you there for a second. Uh, Randy. Yeah, sure. It's not just the resolution making it look like it's pushing. I don't know. It doesn't show me chips inside the simulation, so I'm not sure if it's pushing or pulling, but I'd assume if the tool's sitting in, in you know, I, I guess it depends on which side you shift to. You know, if the tool's sitting over here, vertically here, and the part's spinning this way, that would be, would you call that a push? I'd call that a push, right? Because the part's turning into the tool. The tool's kind of pushing the material away. I don't know. I didn't see you click. I don't think I clicked zigzag, but I may have because I didn't. it might be one of the settings I didn't turn off. Yeah. So zig, I think I use zigs. Yeah, when I was going along, I did zigzag. When I switched it to around, I forgot to change that. So yeah, this should be the zig and that should do it. So there we go. All right.
that one, that one. Make sure, yeah, it's not the resolution. Position the part. All right, I'm going to go 